Jack Cooper, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from Swansea. You are a PhD student working on the functional diversity of sharks through time, and your current work focuses on the morphology and reconstruction of the iconic megalodon shark. Your mentor and PhD advisor is Dr. Catalina Pimiento, a researcher of the evolution of marine megafauna, whose study in 2020 revealed the true size of the megalodon. Well, you're in quarantine at the moment, Jack, having just come back from filming a documentary about sharks with Catalina in Zurich. So can you tell us anything about that or uh, is it all still very hush hush? Yeah, no, it's uh, it is slightly hush hush, but I can't say too much. <laughs> that, that said, though, uh, I can say that it's a German documentary and mm -hmm. it's basically about various myths and their authenticity. This one that they were doing was about sea monsters of the past, and there's going to be a wee segment about Megalodon, where me and uh -huh. Catalina will be included. And I think beyond that, I can say that they're estimating it will be out in about October. Oh, not bad. Oh, so that sounds very exciting anyway. So uh, it'll be a while before we, we see it, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the final product. We got to do some cool stuff, and the interviews were really nice as well. Well, before we sink our teeth into the world of the Megalodon, let's just hear a little bit more about you. Jack, were you always interested in science and evolution, and in particular, in sharks? Yeah, well, I, I will certainly say that I was interested in the science and Megalodon from a very young age. Like many kids, I started off in a dinosaur phase, but it was about the time when I would have been about age six that I first got into Megalodon, and that was because I watched a documentary by the BBC called Sea Monsters, where a zoologist named Nigel Marvin would basically time travel and meet the CGI versions of various prehistoric animals, and one of them was a Megalodon, and it had an absolutely cracking cliffhanger at the end, where it looks like he'd been eaten by the shark. So yeah. immediately uh, after that, I didn't speak much in school at the time. I would have been about six, but I vaguely remember going to school the following week and not being able to shut up about the giant <laughs> shark. <laughs> so I was hooked ever since, and I got this companion book to this series that I basically read nonstop throughout my childhood. Yes, I've got it. <laughs> That, that is it. That is the very book. <laughs> yes. That's the DVD, actually. Yeah. Oh, my mistake. That's the very series, then. <laughs> and so that allowed me and inspired me to pursue a degree in evolutionary biology at the University of St. Andrews, where I got the opportunity to intern in South Africa and mm -hmm. cage dive with living great white sharks, mm. which genuinely was some of the coolest things I'd ever done. And that basically was a great way to look into how these animals are living today in their natural habitat. And because the great white is like such a iconic analog to Megalodon, that's one would argue it's the closest yeah. thing you're going to get to the actual animal. And from there, I went back to the UK and did my master's at the University of Bristol, where I not only met Catalina Pimiento, but I got to do a master's project related to Megalodon, which was oh. recently published. And uh, oh. even that whole experience was so great that I wanted to continue working with Catalina. So I pestered her until we came up with a project together, which we were lucky enough to get the funding on right before lockdown happened. And so I moved to Swansea in September and it's been, that's all she wrote since then. Wow. And uh, cage diving, I know you said uh, to me uh, earlier that uh, the sharks are generally quite chill. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. they. Uh, what's interesting is that there's obviously this 
big thing about like do they associate you with mm. food because you throw bait near the cage and i've seen no evidence to suggest that in actual fact their smell is so good that they're smelling the bait and if the bait's not in the water and it's been taken out as we do they'll have a look at you and they'll say well you don't smell like dead fish so i'm not really that interested in you uh, they'll maybe eyeball you a bit but that's about all they'll do well i i, I gotta admire you jack i would never do that in a million years i wouldn't even get in the water in, in a swimming pool let alone <laughs> what, you, <laughs> what, what you did let's just begin by hearing an overview of this animal. Jack, when was the Meg first discovered and how would you best describe it? So when exactly Megalodon was first discovered is probably not that well dated, but what I am aware of is that in the 1600s, people thought that Megalodon teeth were the stoned tons of dragons. <laughs> so very far off what they actually are. And it was about the 1830s that it was first identified as belonging to a shark tooth. Now, obviously, they were immediately apparent because of how big these teeth are. Mm. And since then, uh, various scientists have measured the size of the teeth. And from that, have been able to calculate sizes of anywhere between 18 and 20 meters as the absolute maximum size Megalodon could reach. And these teeth have been uh, dated to the Miocene and the Pliocene epochs. So that covers a period of between around 23 million years ago to about mm -hmm. two and a half million years ago. And these teeth have been found literally on every continent except for Antarctica. So this shark clearly had a cosmopolitan distribution and lived in every single ocean. And probably if you were a marine mammal or a big fish uh, living at the same time, odds are nowhere was safe from this animal. God, it really did rule the uh, seven seas then, didn't it? Yeah, one could say for sure. And be they were living really just about any latitude as well. Because they've been found in all sorts of places. They've been found in South Carolina, in Mexico, Peru. Uh, mm. I think you can find them in South Africa. They've very recently been found in Indonesia. I think you can find them in New Zealand and Japan. So pretty much anywhere, really. Jack, your work on Megalodon centers on its size and body dimensions. So what did your investigations reveal? And also, how big do we think the Meg could get? Mm. So the basis for our project came from the fact that the Megalodon teeth have been used to calculate the total length of the shark very consistently over the last 15, 20 years. Mm. And this is great. It tells us just how big the shark could get with maximum sizes being proposed as anywhere between about 15 and 20 meters. But what we caught on to was the fact that this only tells us that total length. It doesn't actually tell us how big, say, the head was or the dorsal fin or the gills. And that was what we wanted to know about. So the first thing to do was to identify which uh, living sharks are the best possible analogs to Megalodon. And this also applies when you're calculating the size from its teeth. Mm. Typically, you would use the great white shark because the teeth look kind of similar. And both are lambdiform sharks, both are large macro predatory sharks. But what is interesting is that if you use only the great whites to basically create the rest of the body, all you're really recreating is a giant great white shark. Mm. And since these two animals were not directly related, that is probably not a good place to start. So what we wanted to do was not only use the great white, but we wanted to take the various traits that we know Megalodon had, not just its large body size, but its diet to marine mammals and also uh, its unique adaptation called mesothermy, which essentially allows it to uh, maintain heat in various locomotory organs or other important organs so that its body temperature can remain higher than that of its environment. And that's a Fair, essential part to this formula because that's a very rare adaptation in sharks. It's only seen in the great whites and its immediate relatives. 
and at least one species of fresher shark. So since obviously Megalodon probably didn't have a massive whippy tail for stunning small fish like fresher sharks did, that meant we could narrow down our analogs to the great whites and its immediate relatives like mako sharks, the salmon shark and the poor beagle shark. And once we'd done that, it was actually pretty straightforward from there. We could just take the estimates of various sharks of their individual body dimensions and compare them against the total length of the shark, meaning we understand proportionately how big each body part is. For example, the dorsal fin could be roughly 10% the total length. And what we found is when we applied this across life stage was that these proportions did not change all that much as the sharks grew up, meaning that because they've evolved similar adaptations, a similar body plan, and they all essentially grow at similar rates, we mm -hmm. could reasonably assume the same in Megalodon and therefore apply the same proportions to Megalodon. So from that, we got that its head was about 4.65 meters long, its tail almost as high, about four meters, and its dorsal fin was about 1.62 meters tall, which is about the height of an average adult human being. Gosh, we definitely are going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that a million times. Sorry, Jack. Absolutely. No, abs no I love it because uh, it's like if you're on a boat and you're picturing the fin coming out, it's almost like a boat sail going by rather than a shark fin. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, that, that's, that's a frightening image. You're going to give me nightmares now. <laughs> so do we know what the Megalodon evolved from and why it got so big? These are, this is a great question because, and it, unfortunately it doesn't have a very straightforward answer because Megalodon taxonomy is unbelievably convoluted. For many, many years, it was thought that Megalodon was a direct ancestor of the great white shark because their teeth do look kind of similar at first glance. And because of that, it was called Carcharodon Megalodon for years. But there was a particularly clever study from 2006 that quantified the shape of the teeth and also looked at the serrations uh, under a microscope. And they mm -hmm. found some very subtle differences between the teeth and found that the great white's teeth were actually much closer in shape to ancient mako sharks. So from that, they concluded that the great white was not a descendant of Megalodon. And instead, Megalodon was part of its own separate family that we call the Megatooth clade. And as a result, it's been given the name Carcharocleus Megalodon, or more recently, Otodus Megalodon. The differences between the two are pretty trivial at this point. Either name is acceptable. You can argue with other experts like all day about which one you should be using. But as long as it's acknowledged that it's part of its own family and is not directly related to the great whites or any other immediately living sharks, then you're pretty safe in where you're putting it. So are we talking about convergent evolution or are we talking about uh, just a distant common ancestor here with the, with the great it's, whites? It's possibly a combination of both because hmm. we know that uh, Megalodon was a lamniform or a macro shark, and that was an order of sharks that was very, very common in the Cretaceous, which is when the Mesophermy, the adaptation I was talking about earlier, is thought to have evolved. And on the other hand, no, these days, lamniforms are not quite a species rich. There's only about 15 species alive now, but they're very, very diverse. And by putting, we know from the rare vertebral uh, fossils of Megalodon that its vertebral backbone fossils are quite similar to other lamniforms, and that helps us narrow it down. So where convergent evolution comes in seems to mostly be in the teeth, because despite the clear differences between the two, the Megalodon and great white shark teeth are admittedly somewhat similar. And this is probably because they were evolving similar diets like marine mammals. I know that when people ask paleontologists what Megalodon ate, the answer is usually something along the lines of whatever it wanted. <laughs> but do we <laughs> actually know what the Megalodon preyed upon? 
Well, yeah, you are right to a sense that Megalodon could certainly eat just about whatever it wanted. We think it was almost certainly an apex predator and possibly an apex super predator, given the size of the animals that it could eat. And we know it's eaten all sorts of things like sea turtles, probably ate a few big sharks too. But the most famous fossils that show trace evidence of Megalodon bite marks actually belong to whales and sometimes pretty big ones. And that's rather unheard of in shark biology today that there's a shark so big that it can actually go after and attack big living whales. And perhaps the coolest thing about this is that the serrated bite marks on these whale bones can be so easily attributed to Megalodon. Ah. Given how uniquely big and serrated Megalodon's teeth are, but there has been some studies by a scientist named Stephen Godfrey over in Maryland who has recorded whale bones that not only show bite marks from Megalodon, but they show bite marks in two unique ways. One in the back of the, of the whale, so in the tails, which suggests that they were biting tails to immobilize their prey, keep mm. them from moving, let them bleed to death which is a very similar tactic that great whites use. And there's even fossil evidence of bitten whale bones that have shown evidence of healing, meaning that the whale actually survived a failed predation attempt by Megalodon before it died. So there'd be like evidence of remodeling of the bone? Essentially, yeah, there's been some healing over the wound. And that would indicate that the Megalodon did bite into the whale and bit so hard that it was able to bite into the bone. Amazing. But by some miracle, <laughs> the whale actually survived only to die of an infection maybe some six weeks later. Oh, gosh. I mean, this does remind me of that scene in Jaws 2 where there's a killer whale washed up on the shore and uh, the, the shark in that movie is taking a bite out of it. But I think this, this is going to give me nightmares about <laughs> big whales being chased as well now. <laughs> Jack, a lot of myths exist surrounding this animal, and both you and I are often asked by people, often students, how can I research the Megalodon properly and avoid all the myths and false information? So uh, what would your advice be? Well, the first piece of advice I would give is to know which search engines to use. Googling is... Uh, pretty useful, obviously. And even Megalodon's Wikipedia page is actually not so bad because it records all the scientific papers and its links, so you can use them. But if you want to research Megalodon directly as a student, be it for a research project or just because you're interested, then there's a tool called Google Scholar or Web of Science or Scopsis. And those are all very useful because they link you straight to the actual scientific papers yes. published about Megalodon. If you type Megalodon into Google Scholar, the first things you see coming up are various Megalodon papers from the last 10 years. A bunch of Catalina's papers are the first things you see. You'll see some bite mark papers. You'll see some extinction papers. And I think in the first page, you'll even find my paper as a shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's too bad that not a lot of people know that there's this thing called Google Scholar, and it's very, very handy. It is. I, I confess that I wish I'd known about it much earlier in my life, because I don't think I <laughs> learned about it until my last year of high school. And I think one air of caution I will always note in terms of Megalodon research is knowing, mm -hmm. as well as Google Scholar, that... Megalodon, for whatever reason, is at the center of a surprising amount of conspiracy theories, and I don't know why, <laughs> because it's such a, it's just such a big animal that if it were around, you'd notice. But also, it, me <laughs> but also, it means that there are various people that will conjure up their own theories based on usually nothing. And that's something that needs to be cautionary of. There's a couple of uh, science fiction authors that are very guilty of this. I'm not going to name any names for the sake of uh, getting angry yeah. Twitter messages. It's like <laughs> the Gigantopithecus, which I, which I covered on this channel. It's, like, it's cool, and we would like to see one. So some people just sort of convince themselves that it's possible. Absolutely. And there are definitely a couple of science fiction authors that have published some very bizarre, well, I say published when I may say that, 
I mean, they've actually put out blog posts of absolutely bizarre or insane ideas about the shark being alive or what it might have looked like or how it was living, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, there's a, there is definitely a difference between writing entertaining science fiction and doing actual science. <laughs> Well, the big question that people often ask when it comes to these long-gone creatures is, why did they go extinct? Yes, of course. And again, this is another case where the answer is not as straightforward as it is for, say, the dinosaurs, where we know that a big rock came from space and killed them all. But <laughs> with Megalodon, there's a couple of different things. There's firstly when it went extinct. And we know it went extinct in the Pliocene, somewhere between about three and a half and two and a half million years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, the reasons it went extinct, the first thing you would come across if you Googled it would probably be something to do with climate change and their prey going into colder waters. But because Megalodon was mesothermic, we actually know that it could occupy a wide range of ocean temperatures, mm -hmm. meaning that it could live just about anywhere within reason so temperature didn't actually have all that much to do with its extinction. What we do know, however, is that in the Pliocene, sea levels were actually changing quite violently, so much so that it was ruining various coastal habitat areas, which big animals like Megalodon and the whales it preyed on need to be able to move around. It would have ruined uh, prey availability for Megalodon and may have even affected some of its nursery sites and at the same time, while all this was going on, meaning that Megalodon didn't have enough areas to move around or enough food to consume to justify its sizes, there's been a hypothesis that the Great White was evolving at around the same time and was competing with smaller Megalodons for smaller marine mammals. And that probably didn't help. Another question I'm sure you get asked a lot is, is the Meg still alive? Or could it be? So given all your research, what do you say to that? Well, the good news is I don't get asked that question as much as I expected to over Twitter and Facebook, which is great. But when people do ask that question, my answer is always absolutely no chance. Is it still alive? And of course, you can point to various uh, animals that have been fought extinct and turned out alive, like the coelacanth, the most famous one. But the coelacanth was not a giant apex predator that ate whales. <laughs> And <laughs> there's, a, there's a various reasons why we can be very confident Megalodon is definitely extinct. The first being that the teeth are nowhere to be found in the fossil record beyond the Pliocene. There's mm. absolutely no record of teeth younger than the Pliocene. We also know because it ate whales and that when whales die, they typically float, that if a giant shark killed a whale and then that whale beached up, we definitely noticed that. Not to mention that there, some of Catalina's research found that whales actually got bigger after Megalodon died. So my favorite answer to give when I'm talking about that is it's very possible that whales like the blue whale might not exist if Megalodon was still alive today. And not to mention that Megalodon lived in coastal habitat areas yeah. and we humans rather like the coast. So if we, there was a giant shark swimming around our coastlines and we are all filming our beaches with our iPhones, we would have definitely seen that by now. Yes, and anything we do see is probably going to be faked with CGI anyway. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and you know what you're saying, Jack, about the whales got bigger. Uh, is that because even though the, the Meg was going extinct anyway, um, it was in response to being attacked by them? They thought, oh, you know, evolutionarily speaking, let's get bigger to, so it would be uh, less easy to get a, get a hold of. In a sense, yes. I think it's more that once Megalodon went extinct, there was absolutely nothing around to eat the whales, and there was lots of krill around for them to eat, so they were very free to get as big as they wanted with no worries. You know, Jack, people are going to be wondering why I haven't asked you about uh, the film The Meg or about Jaws. I mean, what do you think of those films? Uh, and uh, do you criticize them when you watch them, or do you enjoy them? 
Uh, I'll start with The Meg then when it comes to that, since that's the most uh, relevant movie to this conversation. I've definitely gotten asked a lot, have you seen The Meg? And then I will say to them that not only have I seen the movie, but as a teenager, I also read the book that it was based on. It's a, it's a film that rightfully does get some criticism for lack of scientific accuracy. But on the other hand, I also can't exactly denounce it either because it's entertainment, you know, yeah. and entertainment doesn't always have to uh, fall within the realms of our scientific accuracies. And also the fact that that movie exists has meant that a lot more people have become yeah. exposed to Megalodon and have learned about Megalodon and become interested in it. And I, I reckon there's definitely a budding paleontologist somewhere who has become interested in that, in that animal mm. because they saw the movie. So for that, I certainly cannot fault the movie for existing. And I think it's great that it made so much money and people are interested in this animal. Like people want to pay money to sit and watch a two hour movie about a giant shark. Yeah. <laughs> and it's certainly uh, for the, 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 the Jaws. Yeah. I mean, that must have produced a lot of paleontologists. Yeah, I actually wonder that because the Jaws book does have a reference to Megalodon. It's a very, very outdated reference, given that it was written in the 70s. And the film briefly shows a picture of a Megalodon jaw. But the film, believe it or not, the Jaws is actually my favorite movie. And that was another big reason I got into sharks, because it made sharks so scary and mysterious. And... I think it's a marvelously made film. I think it's got fantastic characterization. And uh, I would w argue that Larry Vaughn is the real villain and not the shark. Yes. Because the shark, the shark is just doing what, it, what a shark does. It's just going around swimming, mind its own business, and occasionally eating a person every now and then. But Mayor Vaughn is very aware there's a problem, but is totally okay with letting his citizens go in the water when there's danger. And he also blocks Brody's efforts to stop people closing the beaches. So if if I have any of anything I can add to the Jaws commentary, it's that the shark is not the villain, the mayor is the villain. <laughs> and I know from uh, having grown up about 20 miles from Martha's Vineyard where it was filmed, I heard a lot of stories growing up that when the film, came, well, the first film, anyway, when that came out, uh, no one went to the beach for about a year. I think that's true. <laughs> I think that that's, that's, the, that's something that actually happened. Or certainly they didn't go into the water for a year. <laughs> ha, no, it's true. I definitely wasn't keen on going to the beach for a while as a, as a six or seven year old kid when I first watched the film. <laughs> yeah. Jack, it's been such a fascinating interview. Extinct giants like this one always make a great topic for speculation and study. I want to thank you for taking the time to come onto the show to tell us all about your findings. I will leave links to your work and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Jack, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's been great. <laughs>